All right, welcome to Big Book Compendium. Um, you know, so we're on page 156. And we kind of boggled back and forth between 156 and for the second edition. 150, I mean, uh, uh, in, uh, Vision for You gets more detail, that's why I like it. So it says uh, 156, but life was not easy. It says life was not easy for two friends, that's Bill and Bob. Plenty of difficulties presented themselves. Both saw that they must, and there's a must right there, they must keep spiritually active. There's a lot of must in this book. One day they called up uh, a head nurse of a local hospital, that's Akron Hospital. Um, they explained their need and inquired if she had a first class alcoholic prospect. I love that, first class. She says, yes, we've, we've got a corker. It's old school, right there term. Uh, he's beaten up a couple of nurses. He goes off in his head completely when drinking, when he's drinking, but he's a, he's a grand chap when he's sober. Though he's been here eight times in the last six months. That sounds familiar, so some of us, eight times in the last six months. I understand that he was once a well-known lawyer in town, but now, We've got him strapped down tight. So when I say strapped down tight, what that means is, and I'm gonna, as this book study goes on, I'm gonna really get into what they did in these asylums and hospitals. And basically the only thing the hospitals needed, you know, could do because they couldn't legally uh, treat alcoholics in hospitals. They had to sneak him in there. And Bob had connections to the hospital and that's how they got this guy in there. He probably said he had gastritis or something to get him in the hospital. Um, but they, could, they had to do the stuff they did in the asylums and they would strap them down while they're detoxing. And they didn't give them anything, close the door. So um, I'm gonna put up, so they're talking about the man is A number three, and that's this man right here and this famous picture from Alcoholics Anonymous and it's Bill Dotson, D-O-T-S-O-N. And he is a famous picture of the man in the bed. And, um, so it says here was a, a prospect, all right, but by the by the description, none too promising. The use of spiritual principles in such cases was not so well understood as it is now. I'm gonna just close that up right real quick, get back to normal. Um, and the reason it's not understood is because the spiritual approach was totally foreign back then. The only treatment they knew was asylums, and that wasn't really treatment because all they were doing were doping people up and keeping them there for years. And that they sent them out, they were doped up. And uh, hospitals, all they knew to drive people out was hope for the best. That was all, hope for the best. And that best might be that this person gets uh, a few days dry. And I remember hearing an old timer say that one time from an old tape I was listening to. Um, it was Schmitty talking about son. And he says in the early days, all they would really, you know, when a guy would leave a hospital, they never sat there and says, oh yeah, he's going to get, uh, you know, a bunch of time. No, a, a good recovery for an alcoholic was a few days. You know, I mean, good, good, uh, you know, time away from drink. That was the norm. Go back to it, you drink again, you know. So back to the book here. It's, oh, so one thing I wanted to say was, is that's the only treatment they knew. They would hope for the best in the hospitals. Um, but you know, here comes these guys, Bill and Bob, saying we have a spiritual treatment for alcoholism. You know, can we talk to your patients? And they're like, oh, okay. Luckily, Bob had a connection there. He was fam He was well known. But even today, you walk into even a rehab, even a rehab, because they're so far away from the, the program and the steps, or even the detox, and say, I have a spiritual treatment for alcoholism. Can I talk to your guys? They're going to give you a weird look. You know, they're gonna, it's not gonna understand what you're saying. Back to the book. But one of our friends said, put him in a private room, we'll, we'll, be, we'll be down. Two days later, a fellow future of Alcoholics Anonymous stared glassily at the strangers beside the bed. Who are you fellows and why this private room? I was always in a ward before. Said one of the visitors, we're giving you treatment for alcoholism. I love it. Hopelessness was written large on the man's face as he replied, oh, but there's no use. You ever felt that way? There's no use, you know? 
nothing would fix me. I'm a goner. So he's in that victim mindset that so many alcoholics get, can be trapped in for years. The last three times I got drunk on the way home from the hot, from here. Did you ever get drunk on the way home from the rehab? So I'm afraid to go, go out the door. I can't understand it. So he's definitely a real alcoholic because real alcoholics, they drink on the way home from rehab, right? Some people you separate, that don't have the allergy and obsession, you separate them from alcohol and that's all that needs to happen for the rest of their life and they're fine. So it's for an hour, the two friends told them about, drink, about their drinking experiences over and over. They said, he, he would say, that's me, that's me. I drink like that because he's, they're not saying, oh, we you know, drove our car off the cliff and then you know, Bill drove through a church. No, they're not saying that stuff. They're saying, when I drink, I put it in my body and I lose it. And then I, something gets me to drink again, even though it might kill me. And he's saying, that's me, that's me. You know, he's re re relating the experience with the allergy obsession. That's the best way to tell our experience through the allergy. So the man in the bed was told the acute poisoning from which he suffered. How it deteriorates the body, and the alcoholic and warps the mind. That's allergy obsession, of course. There was much talk about the mental state preceding the first drink. That's what they're giving. So it says about the acute poisoning. Acute is, is, a, is a deep word, very old school word to describe something as very or extremely serious, you know, and think about acute poisoning, they're saying. Poisoning is something that's toxic, deadly. So acute poisoning describes the toxic effects the substance of alcohol has on a person, in our case, the mind and the body. So they are explaining to him the allergy obsession, the insanity of the first drink, like I said. They didn't need to get into a bunch of war stories or tell him about God at this moment, hardcore medical facts. It's, and here he goes on again, Dawson. Yes, that's me, said the sick man. The very image. You fellows know your stuff all right, but I don't see how good it will do. You fellows are somebody I was once, but I'm nobody now. From what you tell me, I knew more than I ever, I'm sorry, I knew more than ever I, I can't stop. At, at this, both visitors burst into laughter, said the future a fellow member of Aquas Anonymous, damn little laugh about it that I can see. The two friends spoke of their spiritual experience and told him about the course of action they carried out. So it's like basically, even though there was no four through 12, but it's basically the equivalent of four through 12. He interrupted, I used to be good for the church, but that won't fix me. I prayed on hangover mornings and swore that I would never touch another drop. By nine o'clock, I'll be boiled an hour. You know, we, we, all of us have done that. You know, I can't do it anymore. I'm done. I'm good. You know, two hours later, we're drinking again. Normal people don't do that. Next day, found the prospect more receptive. He had been thinking it over. Maybe you're right, he said. God ought to be able to do anything. Then he added, he sure didn't do much for me when I was trying to fight this booze racket alone. You know, little, you know, self pity victim stuff going on. And, you know, we we, we don't want to blame ourselves. Or, you know, so we're so we're going to blame something like God or something. On the third day, the lawyer gave himself the care, uh, gave his life to the care and direction of his creator. Step three, and said he was perfectly willing to do anything. Steps four through nine. His wife came scarcely daring, daringly to be hopeful, though she thought. She saw something different about her husband already, which is probably true. He had began to have a spiritual experience. So remember the spiritual experience is a sudden overwhelming shift in the God consciousness. And it's usually a result of some type of con you know, contact with God, leading to change in character and wholeness. And the spiritual awakening um, is, is more gradual shift in the God consciousness. And that you know, leads to a different dimension of reality, leading to change in character and wholeness. I think, because in the first edition, uh, first printing, they did, spiritual awakening was not mentioned in the book, only spiritual experience. So when they say we began to have a spiritual experience, they really mean awakening.
you know, because they, they just didn't go back and edit all the way through the book. Um, this is afternoon. He put his clothes on and walked from the hospital free man. I'm sure we can relate a little bit about that. You know, a free man is someone that is no longer ruled or enslaved by something, you know, most of all themselves. You know, it's like, uh, it's to live freely without restraints or restrictions. You know, it's the ability to go anywhere you want to go as long as you, you know, you do the steps. In our case, you know, we set our, we, we, we get set free from this mental obsession. Um, and this man left the hospital a free man. And one thing I learned about Alcoholics Anonymous is not, every, not everybody likes a free man. You know, um, when you start talking about what you've done and how you've done and how you overcame it, not everyone's going to want to hear you to say, you know, there's people who think it's impossible to beat this when it happens because they don't, because they're tried every means in the world. How's this going to help me? You know, and the free man speaks about, you know, and there's doubters because in their insane mind, there's no way anyone can be free. That's why, you know, trying to beat this on our own power doesn't work. We need to do the steps so a power greater than ourselves can set us free. Back to the book, it says he entered a political campaign. So now he's sober and having a spiritual awakening, doing the steps, making speeches, frequent men's gatherings, places of all sorts, often staying up all night. He lost the race only by a narrow margin, but he had found God. I love that. And finding God he had found himself. That's the way it works right there. We find God so we can find ourselves. That's just beautiful. You know, does that mean when we find God, we find our true self? You know, it's, it's because in our case, the false self, the instincts that driven us for so long is the illusion of self. You know, and once we discover that's just the illusion of self, we find out who we truly are. So that was 1935. He never drank again. He too has become a respectful and useful member of his community. He has helped other men recover and is a powerful power in the church from which he has long absence. So you see, there were three alcoholics in town who now felt they had to give to others as they had found or be sunk. After several failures, I think it was five or six, a fourth turned up, and that's Ernie Galbraith, number four. He, you see, he came through an acquaintance who had who had heard the good news. He proved to be a devil may care, care young fellow whose parents would make it would, would could not make it out whether he would stop drinking or not. They were deeply religious people, much shocked by their son's refusal to do anything to do with the church. He suffered horribly from his sprees, but it seemed as if nothing could be done for him. He, he consented, however, to go to the hospital where he was occupied the very room recently vacated by the lawyer. At that time, our friend of, of the hospital incident, that's Bill, I mean, a, a hotel incident, re, re, remained in town. So this is, you know, probably a month into him being there. He was, and it tells us right now, he was there three months. He now returned home, so he's back in New York, leaving behind his first acquaintance as Dr. Bob, the lawyer and the devil may care chap. These men had found something brand new in life. Though they knew they must help other alcoholics if they would remain sober, that motive became secondary. And this is some important stuff to underline. That motive became secondary. It was transcended by their happiness they found in giving themselves for others. That right there, the happiness we find. I tell people, you know what? Oh, I sponsor guys, but it was too much work. That's because you were stressing over it. Anything that you that service that turns that you put stress with feels like work. You don't want to do it. It's not. It's altruistic. Just look, look what they did. They shared their homes, their slender resources. It means they didn't have a lot to give, but they gave and gladly devoted their spare hours to fellow sufferers. What do your spare hours look like? What do you do with your spare hours? So many people say, oh, I get off work and I just, I don't have time. But, if you, you know, a lot of people have time to get loaded. You know, what, as a question is like, think about that. 
Let's see what they did with their spells. They were willing day or night to place a man in the hospital and visit him afterwards. They grew in numbers. They experienced a few distressing failures, but in those cases, they made an effort to bring the man's family into, in, into a spiritual way of living. The man's family, right? Thus, re, uh, reliving much, uh, relieving much worry and suffering. A year and six months later, these three had succeeded with seven more. Seeing much of each other, they, they were scared an evening passed that someone's home did not shelter a little gathering. So this is the original meetings right here, a little gathering and of, of men and women, happy in their release and constantly thinking of how they might present their discovery to some newcomer. That's what it's built on right there. That's the original meetings right there, totally built around the newcomer, 100%. Now listen, now listen to this. In addition to these casual get-togethers, so they had to get, you know, let's say they had two meetings to begin the week. Look at this. It says they begin customary to set apart one night a week for a meeting to be attended by anyone or everyone interested in the spiritual way of life. Anyone interested in the steps, alcoholic or addict or not, whatever. Aside from fellowship and, soci and sociably, uh, the, the prime objects was to provide a time and place where new people might bring their problems. You know, that type of meeting happened a lot in those days, a meeting for anyone that wants to come to the spiritual way of life. You know, these guys really had, you know, a lot of vision. These, are, these guys were visionaries and they had no thought of failure. I mentioned that before a few weeks ago and that maybe the rest of the world might want this. And, you know, that's why the 12 steps, you know, stated having had a spiritual experience, you know, we try to carry this message to others, especially alcoholics, and they changed that. You know, the, the reason why they changed it was because they said, if we're going to be Alcoholics Anonymous, we got to focus on alcoholics, it's plain and simple. People always ask that question, you know, but I had a friend a number of years ago, um, you know, he had two meetings at his house, one in Calistoga, he had a big, huge mansion on the hill and he would do a big book study one night. And then the, then the families of the people that came to the book study would come along with them and they would do a big barbecue and then they'd do another book study. You know, um, it was called The New Way of Life. And this guy had retreats, um, all sorts of stuff. His name's Derek, some of you have met him before. Um, amazing guy. So, um, Let's go to X, X, V, I, I, and we're gonna to go to, this is the middle paragraph and it's forward to the second edition, uh, an X, X, V, double I. And it's gonna talk a little bit more about Akron. Does this work at Akron continue to the summer of 1935? There were many failures but there was an occasional heart, uh, heartening success. When the broker returned to New York in the fall of 35, the first A group actually been formed, though no one realized it at the time. Pretty interesting because it was just a gathering, you know? A second group promptly took, took shape in New York to be followed in 37 by, a, by a start of a third group in Cleveland. That's Clarence Snyder's group. We'll get back into him in a minute. Besides, these, these, there were scattered alcoholics who had picked up the basic ideas um, in, in Akron of, in New York where they were trying to form groups in other cities. Um, by late 1937, the, the, uh, the, the numbers of members have substantial, substantial sobriety time behind them was significant to convince the members that they that a new light had been entered the dark world of alcoholism. So I'm going to put up a um, a slide here, and this is, talk about the first forty of Alcoholics Anonymous. So I'm going to bring this up a little bit. So here's what I want to explain is these first 40, these are the guys that when they sat around the Christmas party in 36 and they looked around the room and they said, we got something going on here. These are those guys. So 
if you look at it, I'm not gonna read every name, but I'm gonna go, go through it a little bit. Yeah, Bill Wilson in 35, Dr. Bob in 36, and Dotson in Galbraith. Then they had five failures in a row. And then Bill goes back to you know New York and he gets Parkhurst. And and uh, that becomes the guy that really helps him with the big Walter Bay, doc, you know, that's Dr. Bob's friend in Akron, Phil Smith. Uh, now Fitz Mayo was the uh, alter Christian guy that would help write the big book. Um, but really without his throwing challenges at Bill to put biblical quotes in the big book, the book uh, may not have gotten as flavor it did. But here's the interesting thing is 11 failures in a row, 11, they didn't quit. They didn't say, I, I, oh, I can't, you know, we're, we suck, you know, we can't do this, no. And then they had um, Silas Bent. And then at the end of 35, they had nine members. So 36, you had uh, Harold Grishner and, and after Harold, 14 in a row, so that's seven for seven and uh, the rest of 36, you know? Um, so they had like 14 failures in a row and then they, had, well, then they went seven for seven, you know? So they had failures. I mean, think of all those failures and that's natural. How many times have you sponsored someone and you, you get seven guys in a row that don't do anything, you know? And, um, but Paul Stanley, that's not the guy from Kiss, I don't think. You know, Paul Stanley, uh, Tom Lucas, all these guys. So, you know, and then that 17 in the end of 36, then you get all these other guys in here in the 37. So 37, they were six for six with four failures. You know, they went six for six and four failures. And then they ended 30, uh, they had one failure, then they have a bunch in a row. Oops, sorry about that. And you know, it's just, it's interesting, you know, to, you know, the, the, this is the, this is the first 40 right here, you know, and, you know, so, so basically, you know, they start writing the book in 37 and that's pretty much where number 40 is. And then just to throw some more numbers out there and in 38, they went 16 for 24 and they had 52 members at the end of 38 in a 39, they had 80 members and in a 40, they had 300, in a 41, 2,000, in a 42, 8,000, in a 43, 160,000. They went from, thir from 38 to 52 members to, 30, to, to 43, you know, 100, I'm sorry, not 100, 16,000 members, but still, that's crazy because of the big book. By 1950, they had, they had 100,000, a little bit, little bit more. But I'll post that list if anyone's interested in it. There's a lot of good information on there with that list. Um, we'll go back to where we were in the forward. Um, so it was this time for the struggling group, groups dot to place their message and unique experiences before the world. This demonstration bore fruit in, in, in the spring of 39 by the publication of this volume. The membership had reached about a hundred men and women which probably about like 80, but that's all right. Fledging society, which had been nameless, now began to be called Alcoholics Anonymous from the title of this book. The flying blind period had ended and they entered a phase of its own pioneering time. Remember, I said that the big book didn't take off right away and it had, you know, it, it spent 20,000 leaflets to, to medical doctors around the country, two people, bought the book, you know, bought the book as favors, you know, they didn't really, you know, they didn't hear anything back from, but 47,000, uh, 4,700 books sat in the warehouse for almost two years. And then all of a sudden, you know, they started getting the good reviews and, you know, here's about those good reviews. Um, with the appearance of the new book, a great deal began to happen. Dr. <clears throat> Emerson Fos Fosdick, the, Another clergyman reviewed with approval in the fall. You know, I've read all this before. You know, there's, there's a lot of other ones, reviews they got in the fall of 39. They also got bad reviews that ripped them apart. You know, that was, it was BS and all this stuff. In 39, Falter Orster, then editor of Liberty, which is a big one, 
printed a piece called Alcoholics and God. This brought a rush of 800 frenetic inquiries into the, the little New York office. Literally, they came into the office, tons of people every day. They're like, they didn't know what to do, you know, which uh, meanwhile had been established. Each inquirer was painstakingly answered. Pamphlets and books were sent out. Businessmen traveled out to existing groups were referred to pro prospective newcomers. New groups started up and were found to the astonishment of everyone that's a, a message could be transmitted in by mail as well as word of mouth. By the end of 1939, it was estimated that 800 alcoholics were on their way to recovery. By mid 1940, they had 1400 members. This is crazy. And one thing I wanna mention, they, you know, they sent, you know, if, if I'm Bill Wilson in New York and I'm, you know, it's going crazy, I'm going to send, you know, Justin to San Francisco and say, Justin, I want you to go there and I want you to start Alcoholics Anonymous in San Francisco. And they only sent the guys that seemed bulletproof, the guys that were really something about them. You know, they're on the same wavelength as Bill. And they, um, it was kind of like the same idea they had with the, you know, the speaking tour they originally wanted to go on before the big book and they had the money to do. They, they sent people to other, other states and that just, that's how they grew it, you know? Um, it says in the spring of 1940, John D. Rockefeller gave a dinner for many of his friends to which he invited a members to tell their stories. And this is to get more money, you know, more, more and, and more, you know, things. News of, of this got out to the world wires, inquiring, inquiries poured in, uh, again and many people went to bookstores to get the book, Alcoholics Anonymous. There's one thing I wanna say is, there's a lot of people just want, just want to go out and, and buy it because they heard about it. By March, 1941, the membership had grown up to 2000. Then Jack Alexander wrote an article in Saturday Evening Post, there's another big one, and placed such a compelling picture of AA, this was huge, before the uh, general public that alcoholics need help, uh, needed of, of help really, Dulged in. By the close of 41, AA had 8,000 members. The article brought in almost 7,000 7, in six months. Boom, you know. Imagine if you're part of that, you know. The mushroom process was in full swing. AA had become a national institution. Um, you know, the one thing is they were so outnumbered at this time by newcomers, they would do what groups call back to basics. And, and they have them today, but it's, the real ones were in there. And basically it's a large group of people because um, sponsors were outnumbered 50, 60 to one in some places or more. So they just do a big group and two or three people would teach it like I'm doing here. And then people raise their hand for spon sponsors. So you go up to them and say, I'm your sponsor. And that's what they did. And, you know, so our society had, had then entered the fearsome and exciting adolescent period. The, the test that it faced was this, could these large numbers, erratic erratic alcoholics successfully meet and work together? Would there be uh, quarrels over membership, leadership and money? And that's why they created 12 traditions, right? Would, would there be strivings for power and prestige? That's why I also traded 12 traditions. Would there be squarms which AA split apart? Soon AA was, was beset by these very problems on every side in every group. But out of the frightening, as its first disturbing, disrupting experience, the, the conviction grew that AA had to hang together or die separately. We had to unify our fellowship or pass off the scene. So remember the, the age old saying is we are people who, people who normally would not mix. Just take this in for a second. This is segregation going on and stuff. You know, there are people in different racial backgrounds, ethnic backgrounds. There are those who had money at one time and those who had money, those who had none, those who didn't have anything and those who had huge, huge egos. There was disagreements over politics. You had people coming in who never really had any kind of power position whatsoever in life and they go to a and they get their instincts fulfilled because they got power those guys never those guys didn't last you know and they wouldn't focus on those guys too much because it was a waste of time you know they were just there for you know political reasons you know 
this is some of the things going on. Let's see what else it says. We discover the principles by which the alcoholic, the, the individual alcoholic could live. So we had to involve principles by which the A groups and AA as a whole could survive and function effectively. That's the 12 traditions. It was thought that no alcoholic man or woman could be excluded from our society, that our leaders might serve but never govern, that each group was autonomous and there was, and, and there was to be no professional class of therapy. I love this stuff. There were to be no fees or dues or expenses were to be met by our, our voluntary contributions. There was to be at the, the least possible organization, even our service, team, service centers. Our public relations were to be based on attraction rather than promotion. It was decided that all members ought to be a, 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 a anonymous at the level of press, radio, and films. And in those circumstances, should we, should we give endorsements, make alliances, or public controversies? This was a sequence of AA's 12 traditions, which, in, which are in full on page 561 of this book. Though none of these principles had, to, had the force of, of rules or laws, they had become so widely accepted by 1950 that they were confirmed by our first international conference held in Cleveland, at Cleveland. Today, the remarkable unity of AA is one of the, the greatest assets of our society has. One thing I want to mention is, think about this for a second. How many groups, a business has mushroomed in the thousands of people where they had 70 or 80 employees, let's say, right? And um, all of a sudden it goes boom, 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 and there's 5,000, you know? And, they, and that, you know, that company was amazing place to work at and great place to be. And then also that mushrooms and it just falls apart because too many people and too many controversies, you gotta have a managing tool. And that was our 12 traditions. While inter internal difficulties of our adolescent period were, were beginning to be ironed out, public acceptance of AA groups by, grew by leaps and bounds. For this, there were two principal reasons for large numbers of re recoveries and reunited homes. All right. So this is important stuff coming up on here. Um, th these made their impressions everywhere. Of alcoholics who came to AA and really tried, 50%, and they used to have a 2% recovery rate, 50% got sober at once and remained that way. 50%, 25% sobered up after, after some relapses. So that's a 75% recovery rate by 1955. Among the remainder, those who stayed, stayed on with AA showed improvement over thousands Others, other thousands came to a few A meetings and at first decided they didn't want the program. But the great numbers of these, two of three began to return as past, time passed. I'm gonna put up a, um, a, give me one second. This is really cool stuff I'm gonna put up here. So this is about recovery rates. And this is kind of controversial stuff, some people hate hearing about recovery rates. But um, so I'm gonna talk about Silkworth, you know, Doc Silk and Towns Hospital, prior to Alcoholics Anonymous. So we get a feel of exactly what these things, you know, what was happening, right? And the thing is um, Silkworth worked with 40, that from, from 1918, I believe it was to 1935 till A started. He worked with 40,000 alcoholics. He had the allergy obsession concept. He had the belladonna treatment they did in the hospital. They did, you know, higher therapy, mild exercise. And sorry, uh, here, here's abstinence. We talked about that, you know? He didn't have a recovery plan. The solution was abstinence. He had a 2% recovery rate, a 98% failure rate out of 40,000 people. That's what alcoholics did. That's all, that was the luckiest we could get. It's a 2% recovery rate, right? And if we're talking about silk horses, it's gonna be all next week. Um, the one thing I wanna mention is this, imagine if you're silk worth, 
and then that happens. Bill Wilson shows up and starts it and he sits back and watches A go to a 75% recovery rate, three out of four people, right? And you know, in 1955, A had 135,000 members. You know, you know, they were claiming 70% recovery rate. That's amazing. Clarence Snyder and, and Cleveland, um, a student of Dr. Bob, you know, no nonsense style, hardcore sponsorship. He's the first guy to sponsor out of the big book. 93 to 97% recovery rate. That's a lot of people that, that went to that area. 93% recovery rate. It's a lot different than 98% failure rate. Minnesota, which is famous for Hazelin and all that, still recovery Mecca, 83% recovery rate, they said. In the 1960s, 80% recovery rate, because they're growing, right? So, you know, as you can see, the 40s and 50s and the 60s, A was not just a program of action, but it was a fellowship of action. They had strong sobriety in, in the fellowship with very high recovery rates to back it up. I don't think the same things are happening in meetings that happen now. You know, they, they boasted about these recovery rates because nothing like it in the field of Auckland was ever, ever seen before, ever. And matter of fact, a newspaper article a guy wrote and when he heard about the recovery rates and he went to Bill and Bill refused, said, you can't post this. He didn't want it posted because press radio and film, you know? In the seventies, the quality of recovery started going downhill. It was, you know, getting harder to keep on track because the recovery boom had hit, right? And so in 80, 87, in 80, 1980 and 87, they did a census report. And um, meaning they went to all the A groups and you filled out over for seven years, they, they followed this, you know, I'm not sure how many members it was, but enough to get a census report. And you can see what they got, 5%. 5% recovery rate. Meaning we went from 90% in the 60s by the 1980, in the 80s, we had 5%. You can see there's tons more people in there, most a million. That doesn't, that doesn't mean anything. And he grew by leaps and bounds and the recovery rates went up in the beginning. You know, 1990, um, they didn't like those numbers, so they did another one, right? Because 5% was wrong. And it came back with a 3% recovery rate. Not good, you know? After that, a stopped doing census reports. As a matter of fact, they stopped even giving out the numbers. We've been stuck on 2.5 million members for 20 years almost. I believe it's more like 5 million or more. Um, in 2002, um, a report from published by Alcoholism Treatment uh, uh, Quarity, it was called, uh, said a 10% recovery rate, 2002. Um, a pushed a new um, report in 2012 and um, they, they, stopped, they, they claimed 20% at best, but that was a guess, it, you know. Um, addiction specialists today, the ones that really know what they're talking about and geek down into it, say it's between six and eight. Um, now I know membership has grown, but you know, you go from 98% or 7% both claims to five to 10, that's, that's sad. So the question is, is what happened? What happened? You know, and the thing is, is that, that it, that this is where it gets deep, right? So let's go back to the beginning, right? Um, speaking meetings, speaker meetings in the early days were the way they did it. They didn't have speaker discussions, one hour speaker or two half hour speakers. I'm going to read from Dr. Bob and the Good Old Timers, where they break down meetings. If you have the book in front of you, it's page 222, 222 of Dr. Bob and the Good Old Timers. We did not need to tell about our, our, our drinking histories at the meetings back then. So, he, so he's saying back then, this book was written in 1950. Frankly, we did not think it was, necess it was anyone's business. Besides, we already knew how to drink. 
what we wanted to, to learn was how to get sober and stay sober. See their focus? So those speakers spoke on how they established relationship with God. It was very common for speakers to, to be centered on God in their stories. So let's get back to what happened. In 1956, the American Medical Association declared alcoholism disease or illness, let's just say, allowing hospitals to admit alcoholic patients with the same priority and care as patients of other conditions, meaning that you, know, you could use your insurance and all this stuff. Hazelden Foundation, founded in Minnesota in 1958, turned, they already established in the 30s, you know, but they've been around. They had these things called halfway houses or guest houses. In 1958, they turned it into the first rehab. That's the Minnesota model, also known as the abstinence model. It was born in 1958, which basically, you in those Minnesota model, it created the 28 day inpatient rehab stay. Um, clinical uh, individualization, you know, treatment, counseling for alcoholism and addiction with active, you know, you get the active family member, you know, involvement, participation of the 12 steps. And part of that experience is something called aftercare, right? Aftercare is ongoing treatment after rehab. And what do they do in aftercare? So the format of aftercare, even today, is you go there and you sit like in a circle. These are guys who are out of rehab. And what do they do? They each talk about how their day was, right? Back then, this is 1958, 60s, 70s, right? Time. The problem was AA started, this is the early 60s, started to lose newcomers to aftercare. They're like, we're, we're not getting any new guys here. We're, what happened? They're thinking they're not going anywhere, but there's guys up the street. Where are they going? And they, they looked around and they, they were losing people to aftercare. So in 1964, the A Grapevine put out an article that suggested groups to try a new style speaker meeting, a new style meeting, a new format called speaker discussion meetings, molded after aftercare groups. This was, you know, the, the um, the was this was this this format ever tested? Never, never tested or tried out. Never tried out. But one mistake A made was. When new meetings were formed, they were doing. They were making them do this format, and um, it was the brainchild of AA World Service as a way to let members. Every member had a voice, even newcomers. A put the microphone, so to speak, into newcomers' hands or anyone that wanted to talk. So in the seventies, A started allowing court-appointed people to appear at A meetings. By the eighties. A, a meetings were never the same. The truth is the, the powerful message of the 40s, 50s, 60s, and a little bit of the 70s, the meetings were long gone and turned into group therapy. You know, less program talk meant low recovery rates and all of those low recovery rates, you know, are they true? I wouldn't bet against them. I, I don't know for sure, but I do know if one does these steps, they still have the 75% to 93% recovery rate, I believe is hundred percent. And, you know, um, it's hundred percent because I've never known anyone that relapsed that did the steps the way they're broken down in the big book. Guys will tell me, oh, oh, I did the steps. And I go, oh, you did? And it goes, yeah, I did every single step. I said, did you make all your amends? No, I skipped a few. Oh, did another guy, did you do step 10? No. Did you have a sponsor? No. I never met a guy walk up to me and says, I did everything. I made every amends. I did this and relapse. I, I kind of, this is not a knock on the meetings, but I like to describe it as broken kneecaps anonymous. So I go to this, this fellowship for my broken kneecaps. I'm in a lot of pain and I go there and all they talk about is their broken kneecaps. And guess what? My kneecaps are still broken. Think of, let that sit in for a second. That's what happens in meetings. That's what we hear and that's what's going on at places. You know, it's not a knock, it's just fact. You know, another reason for the, um, the wide acceptance of AA, um, so let's go back to the book. This is another uh, reason for the wide acceptance of, of AA was the, um, 
administration of friends, families, and medicine and religion and the press together with innumerable others who became our able, persistent advocates. Um, without such support, AA would have made only a slowest progress. Such are these um, recommendations of AA's early medical and religious friends will be found further in this book. And yes, they did. The religion, the, especially the Catholic Church, because um, there was a lot of tie-ins with the you know sacraments and stuff like that. They they were sending people to AA, and they didn't know what to do. And some of the priests were coming to AA, and it, it, it was it was a lot of recommend. And, and then the, the the shrinks who didn't like working with the alcoholics. It says that back to the book. Alcoholics now it's not a religious organization. Neither does AA take any particular medical point of view though we cooperate widely with men of medicine as well as with men of religion. Alcohol being no respecter of persons, we are accurate across uh, across sections of America and distant lands, the same domestic ever uh, process is now going on. By religious affliction, we include Catholics, Protestants, Jews, Hindus, and a sprinkling of Muslims and Buddhists, more than 15% are women in 1955. So, that, so think about this for a second. You know, we talk about racism in our country now. Let's go back to 1955 for a second, where people had drink out of separate water fountains, go into separate bathrooms. It was, a, it was criminal to, be, to, to go into a gathering of groups, criminal, you know? Segregation, 1955, is that uh, is very bad, horrible. The civil rights movement had not had not hit yet. Women's, you know, liberation had not happened yet. Meaning, women did not have equal rights and the same personal freedom as men. And we're coming into two wars, and you know, we're coming out of World War II and the Korean War, and still hurting from the depression. There is a divide amongst people from those kind for, for in our country, much like today, but cra way crazier. There was huge divide in politics. Definitely Catholics, Protestants, Jews, and Hindus, Muslims, and Buddhists did not mix, right? You weren't supposed to do that. It was very squeakly clean time. It was a it was a pot which was ready to explode, as we've seen happen in the 60s, you know. In the middle of that, AA is formed. You know, people were from all different backgrounds, normally would not mix, did not, you know, under the unity of being recovered alcoholics, people who normally would not talk to each other on the streets or be allowed to talk, be in the same rooms. Religious folks from different backgrounds were, you know, hold hands and pray. I always, you know, joke, AA is the only place where you can hold hands with a, mu a Muslim and a Buddhist and do a, do a Christian prayer. Think about that. Where else in the world is that? You know, all kidding aside, A is one of a kind. A really knocked down walls of segregation. Again, that wasn't happening in the 40s and 50s. You know, in 1945, something happened. This is a big thing in AA and a big thing for civil rights too. Um, L.B. Grant, a non-alcoholic arranged a meeting between Charlie G, a white man and civil member of AA and Dr. Jim S, a black man and an alcoholic who was still drinking. So Mrs. Grant had known Charlie when he was you know, drinking and had, and you know, he had told her about how AA had helped him. So upon hearing his story, he arranged the two to meet. Out of that meeting was born the first uh, black group of alcoholics. Now, since 1945, you know, the group survived with the help of guys like Charlie, Charlie G, Bill A, and, and another guy named Chase H, you know, of the original cent central group of, of DC. That's A's pioneer groups of, of you know, of Washington, DC. Those guys are all white, you know. And, you know, this guy, Dr. Jim said, this is what he said. 
they came YA members and stuck by us when they were told not to. They told us how to hold meetings, sponsored us, listened to our stories, brought food to our houses and showed us how to do the 12 step work. They even invited them to, a, they even invited us into their homes without a blink. And their meetings and places, such places mingling, and, and the meetings we went to, such mingling was absolutely forbidden. Think about that for a second. Go back to the book. At the present, our membership is a, is a pyramiding at the rate of about 20% a year. So far, the total problem of, of several million actual potential alcoholics in the world, we have, we have made only a scratch still to this day. We're, we're just a tiny speck. In all probability, we shall never be able to, to touch more than a fair fraction of alcohol problem in all its ramifications. Upon therapy for the alcoholic himself, we surely have no monopoly Yet it is our great hope that all those who have found no answer may begin to find one in the pages of this book. And you will presently join us on the high road to a new freedom. It's pretty, I got emotional reading that last part there, you know, and I get chills when I read that, absolute chills. You know, um, here's why. You know, here's a, this is a movement growing fast, yet there's only a scratch in the alcohol problem. You know, we only touch a fraction of the problem, just a fraction. Al believe it or not, there's alcoholics that have been practicing drinking for 40 years and never even heard of AA. You know, A is only a small little fraction of alcoholics in the world. Think how blessed we are to have, you know, to, to, to be brought in you know it's our home you know even more blessed we are part of that fact you know fraction of, of you know we're not we're, that we're not part of that that small fraction that larger fraction you know i like it we're part of this little tiny fraction that's why i get chills because we're miracles you know of a, of a miracle program walking hand in hand as he said the road to freedom so when you, you go to bed tonight, just realize you're blessed. You know, think of what these guys did and what they did for us. Think of the things they did, you know, what they went through. I mean, the, you, you go through the early times where they had no, a no failure attitude and also boom, it mushrooms up to something huge, right? People could have given up a long time ago. I watched so many guys give up on sponsors. You know, the sad thing about Alcoholics Anonymous is a lot of alcoholics give up on other alcoholics really quickly. Thank God the early guys didn't do that. I see it happen a lot now. I never fired a sponsee because he wasn't doing work. They just kind of float away and then they come back, they, 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 want, it, they want it more. So I'm gonna stop it right there and